And I just want to thank everybody uh, for tuning in tonight to hear the gospel. It's a great privilege any time to be able to tell about our Lord Jesus Christ and the great work he's accomplished at Calvary and how people can be blessed through him. I thank you, Mark, as well, uh, for inviting me to be able to give a little word of testimony tonight and just to tell how God reached me through the gospel. So I want to turn tonight in the New Testament. We're going to look first at Romans chapter 3, please. The book of Romans and chapter 3. If you do not have a Bible with you, I will be reading through verse by verse. But if you have a Bible, by all means, we would encourage you to open to Romans chapter 3. And we'll break in at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Well, I'm going to explain a little bit about what this means in a moment. But Paul the Apostle, being a Jew, someone from the nation of Israel that had been given the law of Moses and had all the privileges the word of God handed to them, he says, are we better than they, the Gentiles, in other words, those that did not have Moses' law? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And we have a whole catalog listed. And now it has gone from God as judge to the physician, and he's giving really the symptoms of the problem and things that mark those that do not know God. Look at verse 18. He says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 20 tells us, therefore by the deeds of the law, that is the keeping of the commandments, there shall no flesh be justified. No one made right. In his sight, God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's the purpose the law was given. Now we're going to turn back to John's gospel, please, and chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're just going to read one verse, one brief verse in John's gospel in chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 29, please. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. One final verse in John chapter 3, please. So just two chapters over. John's Gospel chapter 3, very well-known verse, no doubt, to most, if not all, that are tuned in tonight. John chapter 3 and verse 16, 25 golden words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let me quote that one more time, please. It's worth quoting. God forbid it should ever become commonplace coming from our lips. For God so loved the world. That's the world we read about in Romans chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have ever. I will bless the reading of his word with a little word of testimony tonight. But allow me before I begin the testimony portion, just to say this, that when we're looking at the book of Romans, 
it, it's um, to take note of the fact that the gospel is being unfolded before our eyes and something of the human condition and of God's provision for humanity. And when I think about Romans chapter 1, we could read words how it tells us that he changed the truth. Mankind changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So we see there, really, if you will, the pagan in God's sight. The person who would worship idols of wood and stone. If we were to turn to chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul says, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, thou that judgest another. He says, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth, doest the same things. And in chapter 2, we have the moralist. The person who can look at the pagan and say, I don't live that way. I have a much, a much higher standard of life and living and morals. But then if we were to look at chapter 3, where we broke in, Paul now is addressing in chapter 3, verse 1, he asked the question, what advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there in circumcision? And he says, much every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So there's even a much higher responsibility. And there was a people that were handed the law of Moses. And they had a divine standard that was given to them. So we have the, uh, the immoral pagan, or I should say amoral, no morals. Then we have the moralist who can look down at the pagan. And then we have the Jew who has God's law. And Paul in this chapter sums it all up. As he goes through all of humanity, that really is a, a, a pattern, if you will. Uh, the Jew themselves haven't been given the word of God, the oracles of God. And he looks over all three people and he says, there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, dear friend, those that have religion, those that have a divine standard, they fall so terribly short of it, and they sin against light that has been given. Just as well as the other two groups, the pagan and the moralist, the moralist who doesn't even live up to his own standard that he sets for himself. And God sums it up, and in the presence of a holy God, a God who knows our thought life, a God who understands every word we speak, and who is really, literally, if you look at the book of Revelation, you'll see these things are being written down in a book. God who knows all things, he sums it up and says there's no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So dear friend, the gospel that we are preaching tonight, it is a gospel that we have we've used the word in john 3 and 16 whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life it's a gospel that meets the need of every man woman boy and girl in this world irrespective of culture irrespective of color irrespective of religion irrespective of any thought you may have or any understanding you may have or you may not have concerning God. Whether you're someone who's learned the scriptures from a child, or if tonight may be the first time you're tuning in and hearing the gospel, I just want everyone in the Zoom call tonight to understand this. This gospel meets your need as an individual. Thank God for that. You know, I was just thinking recently, Mark mentioned the open air preaching in downtown Toronto. And I was preaching about the cross. And I was highlighting things that happened at Calvary that were written beforehand. Some of them 750 years before the event took place when Christ went to the cross. And when I was finished, and I finished speaking about how God, ultimately, it was the, the fact that God poured out upon him the punishment for sin. 
I had a man come over and wanted to speak to me and we sat on the curbside and he said these words. He said, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Dear friend, it's our purpose in the meeting tonight and we pray tonight that you may have that very thought in your heart tonight as you hear the gospel. That you may take stock of what is being told and you might consider in a personal way and you might wonder, why would God do that? You see, the person who took the judgment for sin that we read about in John chapter 1 and verse 29, I read those words, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John was pointing at the Lord Jesus when he spoke those words. And tonight, to understand that he is absolutely sinless and impeccable. What I mean by that is, not only did he not sin, he couldn't sin. You see, friend, he's absolutely holy. He's a son of God. And he's impeccable. He couldn't sin. Maybe someone tonight would wonder then, why would God pour his judgment upon him? I pray tonight there might be someone listening that would be wondering those words tonight in your heart. You know, I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I know there may be some tuning in. I don't know. There may be some tuned in that were raised in a Christian home and had the privilege to hear the gospel for years. Many times I speak to people and I talk about how it's interesting to hear about someone who wasn't raised in a Christian home. Let me say this. I love to hear about people who were raised under the sound of the gospel. It's a marvel to me. It's a marvel to me to know that someone could be preserved from the wickedness and the degradation that is out in this world tonight. And it was what I came from, friend. And I'm telling you, the only regret that I have concerning the gospel, if there's any, I, I don't think there really is. But if there's any regret at all, it's that I wasn't saved when I was young. A great privilege to be raised under the sound of the gospel. You know, there's an old cliche that says misery loves company. Miserable people, in other words, like others to be unhappy as well. Now, I grew up in a good home. We had a Bible in our home, although we didn't read it. It was a religious home. My parents were actually born and raised in Uruguay, uh, down in South America. My father, at one point, was a professional soccer player, um, as a uh, not a young teen, but up in his middle to late teens, he was playing professional soccer in Uruguay. And so sports and competitiveness and all those things were very important in our household. So I was raised in a good home. We were taught morals. My father was very hardworking. He was a very honest person. He didn't think you should cut corners. And he was very convinced that in order to be any uh, positive influence and of any worth in society, you need to be a hard worker and you need to be truthful. So that's the kind of home that I was raised in. My mother taught Sunday school in a denomination that did not preach the gospel and that did not know gospel truth, that could not tell you that you can know and you can be certain that your sins are forgiven. So we had a Bible in the home, but it wasn't read. But my parents raised me with moral standards that, and expectations that I should be living up to. Now, growing up, when I was in school, one area that was not my strongest area would have been mathematics. And because I played competitive soccer and we used to go on tournaments through the US and Canada, there was an expectation that I would keep my scores in school up to a certain level. And if they dropped below that, I would have to do something in a hurry about it or I'd be missing soccer tournaments. And that meant a lot to me. So when I was a teen, when I was 12 years old, going from grade seven into grade eight, my mathematics scores were not very good. And my mother gave me an ultimatum. She said, if you go to summer school class and you take math courses and you're able to do at least well so that I know when you go into grade eight before high school, you're able to bring up your scores and go into high school with good scores and a good reputation. She said, if you're able to do that, you can continue in soccer. So I thought that that was what I have to do. So I went to summer school. 
Now, when I went to summer school, I met a young man named Brad. I didn't know anything about him but this. He loved the outdoors. He loved to fish. He loved to hunt. Uh, he loved to build forts and do these things out in the woods. So having known this about him, at least that much, I thought this is exactly the kind of person that I want to keep company with. What I didn't understand was that he was keeping company with the high school kids from the neighborhood. What I didn't know is that he was from a broken home where every day coming home from school, he would find his mother laying on the couch with an empty bottle beside her. She was an alcoholic. His father had left him as a child, left the home and left the mother destitute. And she, she, though she was a school teacher, she became an alcoholic. And I didn't know those things. And also what I didn't know was that it was having a profound effect upon him to the point where he began to rebel. Now, when I met him, I didn't know that. I just knew that he loved hunting and fishing. And so we took to each other, each other quite easily, became friends. If you had asked me at the time when I first met him, would you ever use drugs? I'd say, no, that's for weak-minded people. That's for people who want to throw their life away and want to, want to basically end up on skid row. I, I wouldn't do that. I'm not, I'm not that weak-minded. But by the time I was 12 years old and probably within a few months, he had me try smoking. I began to drink. I began to use some drugs. A lot of them were softer ones when I was 12. But by the time I was 13 years old, we were using drugs that were much harder. And understand that I didn't have a full-time job to be able to support that kind of a thing. So I began to sell them at school. And sometimes to take classes off to go to the local high school to sell them to other people. That was at 13 years old. I marvel when I think about that because I have a 14 year old boy right now. And though he's mature in many ways, he's still very much underdeveloped. He's only 14 years old. And when I think that by 13 years old, my life had already spiraled and began to go out of control. I can hardly believe it, but that's what happened. Looking back, I, I couldn't trust my own friends. I began companying with people that I, I would always have to look behind my back because they would either want to try to manipulate you into something that you shouldn't be doing, or they would be wanting to steal something from you or to lie to you in a way that would be advantageous to them with no regard for you as a person. You see, friend, it makes me think of the writer to the Proverbs in chapter three when he said, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent not. And the writer goes on to say, it's going to take you down a road. They're going to entice you and say, we'll all share in one purse. We'll all share of the spoils. And he says, for their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. And they lurk privily for their own lives. You see, dear friend, the writer to the Proverbs is saying simply this. That there are those that will entice you into something. And you'll, want, you'll be enticed by what you think is going to bring pleasure. And you may think you're laying a trap for another. But in the end, it's only going to be you that's going to fall in that trap. That's exactly what sin does, friend. That's exactly what it's like in the world tonight. And that was exactly what I got involved in. I remember constantly looking behind my back. I remember in my teens, one time being in a car where there was a drug dealer that was probably wanted by police. I don't know. He was a friend of a friend. And an undercover police car came up behind us and turned on some kind of a siren or put on his light or whatever. And the driver thought he was going to go on a high-speed chase and elude this police officer. And he started running through intersections at full speed. And I began to, I'm holding on to the interior of the car thinking, this man is going to kill us. And he skidded around a few corners, opened up a garage, pulled in, 
And that was it. And I remember getting out of that car and looking up and saying, thank you, God. Because I knew intuitively, if I were to die in this condition, if I were to die today at this age, the way I am, not right with God, I don't know my sins forgiven. I'm not ready to meet God. You know, friend, you don't have to be a drug addict or be involved in crime to be not ready to meet God. There may be somebody listening that's in a Christian home, privileged home. You've heard the gospel for years, but you know you're not saved. You know that what you hear preached week after week, you've never come into the good of personally, and it's never transformed your life, and it's never changed your standing with God. What would happen if you breathed your last breath? I used to wonder that. You know, when I was growing up, I had my first experience with death personally at the age of 16. When a friend of mine bought a motorcycle, and this is in the high school setting now, and he has a spare between classes, and him and another friend of mine decide to go on their motorcycles and zip up and down Winston Churchill Boulevard in Mississauga. And what they did not know is that there had been construction that week and there had been a race sewer that hadn't been fully paved over. And they were going at such a high speed that he just noticed a police car and he tried to apply the brakes and he hit one of those sewer lids and the bike went out of control into a speed, what they call a speed wobble. And he hit a cement hydro pole. And at 16 years old, that young man lost his life instantly. I remember being at the funeral and I remember looking down into the casket of, at the face of that young man. And that was the first time I'd ever experienced what it's like to see someone who lost their life. And I remember looking at his form and thinking it does, it, it, it looks like him, but not really. Something is missing. You know what was missing, friend, was life. He was absolutely devoid of life. And I remember sobering up for a moment and looking in his face and thinking, what if that were me? And it caused me to tremble. I had other instances in my life. There was a girl named Rhonda I knew when I was around 17, probably within a year of that incident, who sadly, tragically took her own life, had parents that loved her. And she took her own life. And I remember being at that funeral and just seeing the broken state of her family and looking again at a friend of mine that I had just spoken to days before. I remember another young man named Rohan that was extremely fit, used to play soccer. I used to train in the, in the park behind my house with him because we both played competitive. And one day I'm, I'm reading the newspaper and there's his picture in the news. And it said that young man shot at point blank range because of a drug deal that went bad, right at a busy, right in front of a busy mall on a Saturday afternoon. I could tell story after story, friend, of people that I was close to, that I kept company with, that didn't, did, never got out of their teenage years. And every time I would look at the form of that person, and I would think, what if that were me? You know, dear friend, there's a verse in the scriptures, and it's found in the book of Job. And the, and the question is asked, man dieth and wasteth away, yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? I wonder if you've ever considered if it were you, where would you be? That used to bother me. But the scriptures tells us clearly that God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. As soon as we left a funeral, we'd go back to a friend's house. We'd begin to drink. We'd begin to use drugs. All the other wicked things that I won't even go into detail about tonight, friend. I wouldn't do that. All I It would just suffice to say that the things we were involved in, my dear friend, all they were meant for was to keep us on a road to destruction and it would clear our minds of these thoughts these sober thoughts we would have after looking at the form of a person we knew who had died tragically 
You know, as I got older, these sobering thoughts began to invade my thinking. I couldn't help it. I remember, in fact, as I got into my early 20s, I began to have very definite, distinct dealings with God. Again, I want you to understand, friend, I had never read the Bible. Never. I could not tell you what John 3.16 was. I did not know that there was an Old and a New Testament. I had absolutely zero Bible knowledge. But the Spirit of God began to work with me. And I remember as I, I would go to a nightclub downtown Toronto. And, and all the music was there. And the smoke. And all the things that were happening in that atmosphere. And the pounding of the music. And all of a sudden, it could be 2 o'clock in the morning. And my mind would just sober up for a moment. And I would look around the nightclub and see all the things that were happening. And the thought entered my mind, something is not right about this place. There's something very evil about being here. And it used to bother me. Those thoughts would spill over. We'd end up at 4 o'clock or 4.30 in the morning in the basement of a friend's. And we'd continue drinking. And all of a sudden, we'd begin sobering up. And we'd begin speaking about spiritual things and talking about what happens after you die. I remember one night particularly, a friend of mine had a Christian sister. His sister became a believer. She trusted Christ. She started telling him stories in the Bible. We would sit in the basement or in a bedroom of a friend's home, and he'd begin telling and recounting these stories to us. And now the Spirit of God is taking the Word of God and applying it in my mind. I remember someone, this young man in particular, turned to me and said, Steve, he said, I was speaking to my mother. And she said, you cannot look at creation without understanding the vastness and the complexity of it and not acknowledge that there's a God behind it, an intelligent designer. He said, that's why she believes in God. He said, why do you believe in God? I couldn't give him a straight answer. But one thing I knew, I said to him, I believe there's a heaven and a hell, and I never want to be in the latter. You see, friend, God was having dealings with me. I remember sitting on the 26th uh, floor of a balcony of a condominium overlooking Mississauga. And as I'm sitting there, intoxicated, unfortunately, but my mind is clear enough to look over the city, and I start saying, God... My life is in a state of misery. I hate the way I am. Why is life like this? Why does everything feel so empty? Why does everything seem to have no purpose? Even my father, who was a hardworking person, he'd be up in the morning at the same time. He'd work all day. He'd come home to eat. He'd go back out to work. And it was this constant cycle. And I thought, what is the purpose of all of this? If in the end... You just go into a grave. You see, God was beginning to speak to me very distinctly. While this was happening, I did not know this. But a young man, and I was telling my brother Mark this just before we began the Zoom meeting. There was a young man who was sitting in a prison cell. And he's given a Bible. And he begins to read it. And he reads these words. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said... He thought, what kind of person knows people's thoughts? So he began to read the scriptures in prison. When he got out of prison, a young man named Dean Omard contacted him. Dean had been going to university and was saved. He brings him to gospel meetings. He said, I don't remember who the, the first preacher was, but the closing preacher was a man named Albert Hall. And he said, I don't remember much of what he said, but this he said at the end of the meeting, if you leave the meeting in the vehicle that brought you here and you get into an accident on the highway and you go into eternity without Christ, he said, as certain as I'm on this platform tonight, your soul will perish in hell. He said that shook me to the core. I began to pace up and down Young Street until three o'clock in the morning. I cried out to God, God, have mercy on me. I don't want to perish. And he said five words flooded his mind from that meeting. Christ died for the ungodly. 
And he thought if he died for the ungodly, that means he died for me. I'll trust him here on the street. And he trusted Christ. That young man brought the gospel to me. Now understand, this, that young man, before he went to prison, he was the fiercest, probably most unstable person I knew. I saw him fight the police physically, three or four of them at a time. I knew of him constantly having fights with people from bike clubs and doing things that I, I could not believe. Robberies and all sorts of things like this. He was absolutely unstable. And all of a sudden, my friends say he's become religious and he's lost his mind. Every time I saw him, he was as, I've never seen him calm like this before. I thought this, that they must be right. This guy must have flipped his lid. But every time I saw him, he was kind to me. He bought me a drink. We'd, I'd be in the mall and I'd bump into him. He'd buy me fries. He'd say, you eat lunch? No, here, I'll buy you something. And, and every time I saw him, he was kind to me. And he always had a verse from the Bible. He said, Steve, do you know this verse? I'd say, no. He'd say, let me share it with you. Understand, I had tried to avoid him like the plague. I'd be on the transit bus going across the other side of the city. And all of a sudden he's at the stop and he gets on and he comes all the way at the back and sits beside me and says, Steve, I've been praying for you today. I'm downtown Toronto. I lived in Mississauga, but now I'm downtown Toronto. I'm walking down a busy street on a Saturday in the summer, crowded street. I bump into him and he goes, Steve, I was just thinking about you. Now it got to the point where I thought this is crazy. What is going on here? And I thought, you know, my friends keep telling me he's lost his mind. But every time they, whenever we spoke about what happens after, after you die, they said, I think, I suppose, maybe it's this. None of them had any answers. Every time I spoke to him, he opened the Bible. He said, this is what it says. One day on the bus, he says to me, Steve, have you ever heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? I said, no, I haven't. He said, let me tell you about it. And he opened the scriptures. And he said at the end, he summed it up and said this. He said, God poured fire and brimstone sulfur upon those cities because they sinned against him and lived wickedly. He said, what is stopping God from doing that today? That bothered me. I never forgot that. It was like an arrow. It bothered me so much that I, I was ready to forsake everything my friends were, were telling me. And I, I told them, if you don't want to talk to him, that's fine. I'm going to listen to him. And one night at my friend's house after a nightclub, I said, boys, I said, I'm going to church. And they all laughed. They broke out laughing. And one young man goes, it's a great place to meet girls. And I said, that's not why I want to go. I said, I, I think I need to know more about God. So he brings the gospel to me. He's calling me week after week. Every single time I had intention to go and, and I wanted to go, but when it came to the moment and he'd call me and he'd say, should I come pick you up now? I'd say, Chris, I, I, I can't, I've got something else that's come up. Or I'd say, I can't, he didn't have a car at the time. I'd say, I can't drive. I can't put the miles on my father's car. Not this time. Sorry. Do you know why that was happening? Because Satan as it were, would have been whispering in my ear and tapping me on the shoulder and saying, wait a second, maybe your friends are right. Maybe he's crazy. Maybe what he's saying is completely off the wall. Just put it off. You go another time. Do you know why Satan does that, friend? And do you know why if there's someone listening and you're not saved, do you know why perhaps maybe you've been putting it off? Because the devil is just like you and me. He doesn't know when we're going to breathe our last breath. And had I died in that condition, friend, I'd be in hell forever. And I would deserve it. Finally, he asked me probably the sixth or seventh time. And I thought, I can't keep lying to him. All he does is kindness. He's not like my friends. I can trust him. I can't trust them. I thought, I'll go this once, just once for him. And I went. And him and Dean preached the gospel. As one got up and preached, the other would open the scriptures and I would read from their Bible. I thought it was quite normal to sit in between the two preachers in the front. I had no idea. 
I didn't even know there was an Old and New Testament. But one would sit and open the scriptures, the other would get up and preach. And when the end of the meeting came, I thought, oh, I'm a little bit better than my friends here at home. At least I'm out here. And the music sounds great. It wasn't music, but it was singing. The singing sounds lovely. I began to become a little bit self-righteous. And I thought, you know, I'm not as bad as some others. When I got to the door, the man at the door said, what did you think of the meeting? I said, it was really nice. I enjoyed it. It was great. You know, if there's somebody hearing the gospel tonight, and that's what you're thinking, friend, you need to awaken out of your slumber. If I really knew what would happen if I died, I'd be trembling after hearing that message. Those two men would have preached faithfully. They would have preached of a hell to shun. They would have preached of a heaven to gain. They would have preached of a cross where Christ paid the debt for sin in his own blood. They would have preached of his glorious resurrection and his seating at the right hand of God and his coming again. But I was totally blind. I left that meeting in total blindness. We got in the car and as we were driving, Chris said, open to where I have the page marked. And it was Romans chapter three where I read tonight. And he said, Steve, I want you to understand that's God and he has the human race in a court case. And I read down the verses, down to verse 19. Every mouth stopped, all the world, guilty before God. And dear friend, I didn't feel a thing. But let me tell you this. What I understood for the first time is, if I die like this, I'll be in hell. And I'll perish. That was an awakening. He gave me his Bible. I read from that Sunday evening through Genesis right to Tuesday, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and I started reading into Deuteronomy. And all it did was further the burden upon me because I thought I could never live like that. Nobody ever could. There's too much. And I just started to feel more and more guilt upon my conscience. And the Tuesday he called me and said, there's a Bible study at Mimico. I want you to come with me. So I said, I'll go. I would have went to anything to know peace. And he picked me up and we went to the Bible study. The whole study, understand, they were in 2 Corinthians, right around where Paul in chapter 11, he's talking about all the hardships he had gone through. And yet they're nowhere in that passage. They're preaching John 3.16. They're quoting Romans 5 and 6. Christ died for the ungodly. All these verses that talk about the work Christ has accomplished and how a sinner can come into the good of it. And when that meeting was over, I said, Chris, I want to be saved more than anything. I want to be saved tonight. He said, I'll introduce you to someone. He introduced me to William Spencer, one of the men on the oversight. What a godly man. He said, pleased to meet you. My name's Bill Spencer. I said, I'm Steve I said, I want to be saved tonight more than anything. He said, Steve, I cannot save you. These people, we'd love to see you saved, but they can't save you. All we can do is open the scriptures and point you to the one who can. Now, I didn't get saved then, but I went home that evening. And for the first time in my life, I don't know what time, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, I went down on my knees and I poured out my heart to God. God, I'm perishing. I'm going to hell can you please save me? I began reading in John's gospel because it was one page that he marked. And I got to verse 29. John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And my dear friend, for the first time in my experience, I understood that's why Christ died. He was bearing the judgment for sin. Here I am, a lost sinner, guilty. Guilty and totally helpless. If he took away the sin of the world, that takes in my sin. And that night, right at my bedside, I put my trust in him. I thought, it couldn't have been that simple. How is this possible? I kept combing through the pages and reading I got to, to John 3 and 16. Understand, I didn't even know that verse. Never read it. And I read, for God so loved the world. That took me in. That he gave his only begotten son. That's the cross. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. I said, there it is. God says it. I'm willing to take God at his word. My dear friend in the meeting listening, whoever's listening tonight, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and he rose again on the third day, not according to your feelings, according to the scriptures. Would you tonight be willing in simplicity just to believe God? That's why Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Pray that God would bless this to those that have heard. Let us pray. Our Father, we give thanks and marvel at the privilege of ever being able to hear the gospel and some so many times in their life. We pray whether this would be the first time or whether it's been dozens, that whoever is listening tonight, if there's someone that does not have peace with God, that they might put their trust and their confidence in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank thee for the simplicity of the message. He that hath the Son hath life. And so we commit the results to thee. We bless thee and praise thee for the Lord Jesus that paid the debt of sin that we owed. We give thanks in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening.